Does that matter? Okay. Steve Bowers is confused. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. We want to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. We all know that good government is important, and we are we achieve our goal of good government when the public participates, and we appreciate that very much. Thank you. It's good good that you all want to be informed. We're going to deviate slightly from our from the agenda that we have. Uh, we're going to we're going to call up our chairman of our board of commissioners, Sam Moore, in just a minute, and he's going to talk about the uh, SPLOS vote that's coming up. Uh, the first thing we do before we we call Sam up is I want to uh, introduce you to all the candidates we've got. A, we've got a lot of candidates here tonight, and it should be a very interesting program. We certainly hope so. Uh, we have candidates for the Georgia uh, Senate race. I believe this is District 24. I'm, I'm not certain. It is 24. Good. Um, and I'm going to read their names in alphabetical order for you. Uh, we have Lee Anderson. We have Joe Edge and Peter Gibbons. Pat Goodwin. Greg Grabowski. And Brenda Jordan. They're all here and they're contesting the Georgia Senate race in Dis Senate District 24. We have two Superior Court judge candidates here tonight. Uh, many of you know that I'm a lawyer, and so I'm familiar with both of these folks. We're pleased that they both came tonight. Uh, we have Griff Hammond and Bubba Swan. They're both here, and they're going to talk to you a little bit about themselves and answer some questions as well. Uh, we have two candidates for the Office of District Attorney. Uh, many of you know that our district attorney, Dennis Sanders, is retiring at the end of this year. And Woody Davis and Bill DuPay are here so that you can meet them and, and listen to them as they tell you about themselves and their experience uh, as they buy for Dennis Sanders' seat in the election. Uh, we have two candidates for a tax commissioner of Wilkes County. Lisa, Lisa Dozier and Dean Hubbard are here. And... Uh, we have two candidates for sheriff of Wilkes County. The incumbent, Mark Morris, here, and Greg Rogers, the challenger, and we'll hear from them. Uh, we have Commissioner Esper Lee here. He uh, is a candidate for election in District 1 to the uh, Wilkes County Board of Commissioners. And we have some candidates who are unopposed that came tonight so that you could meet them if you don't already know them. Uh, we have Ed Gettings, who represents District 2 on the Board of Commissioners. We have Probate Judge Thomas Sharpie, who's seated right here in front. He's going to speak to you. We have the candidate for Chief Magistrate Judge to uh, replace Judge Rosalie Martin. Her name is Deborah Green, and she's here to talk to you so that you can meet her. And we have three candidates for the Board of Education. Ricky Callaway, who is chairman of the Board of Education. Ashley Barnett, who is running for a seat in District 4, and Ashley unfortunately had a prior commitment and can't be with us tonight, uh, and DeAndre Norman, who is a candidate for the seat for District 3. And we have our coroner, Blake Thompson here. He's running unopposed for another term, and he'll speak to you as well. So at this time, I would like to call on our chairman, uh, Sam Moore, who's chairman of the Wilkes County Board of Commissioners, in the second term, maybe his third, I can't remember. He's going to talk to you about something very important, and that is the SPLOS vote, which is coming up on the May 24th ballot. So I'm going to turn it over to Sam. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, the SPLOS vote is, has done a lot of really important things through the years for Wills County. Uh, the first thing was... The courthouse. The courthouse, our courthouse burned in 1958, and uh, 30 years later, we put the we put the towel back on it uh, through the squash vote. So when y'all leave tonight, you can go look at our courthouse. The courthouse has been renovated through three squash votes, and uh, and we've really got a nice, great courthouse that that we can really be proud of. The administrative office was added. The, uh, the the jail that was that we had since 1911 that that stayed one of the nicest jails we thought in the whole area until so Judge Alamo decided that it was unfit to house prisoners, so we had to build a jail that's out by the primary school. Uh, 
That was built in the mid in the late night in the or ninety six I think is when it started. But it was built on the splash boat too. So a lot of those things that we we've, we've gotten done, uh, you know, that's been really important to to keep in our community, you know, modern and and you know a great place to live have, have been accomplished by the splash boat. Uh, a lot of the things we've done through the years uh, with the splash boat has been to to buy capital capital things like trucks, dump trucks, motor graders, trash trucks, things like that that actually save you money on your on your property taxes. So the sales tax is a is a fairer tax than the property tax because since I've been in office, the General Assembly has has given exemptions from $14 million to $100 million. So, so people are getting exempted out of property tax. And, and a few of, you know, if you own a home, you're, you're, you haven't got any exemptions. So your property tax has gone up because the state of Georgia has given so many exemptions through the years. From 14 to 100 million in exemptions is a lot. And we, we have to try to balance to, to uh, the state keeps giving all of these different things that they do from the gate card to the TAV tax to, to all the things that they give exemptions for that it, that it even exempts sales tax that you know affects your homeowner property tax. But this, the splash and the loss, the loss does roll back your property tax. Uh, but the squash uh, is set up by the General Assembly for us to, to do special projects and to do capital outlay. And, um, and I think we've got a good, good list this time. It, it kind of helps a, you know, a broad section of our community. We have, uh, we have vehicles for EMS, for sheriff, and for fire. And on the fire side, we have really improved our rural, rural areas with fire protection, with tankers, and, uh, and we're hoping soon to get our ISO ratings down. So if you live in the county, uh, you may have seen some of the write-ups in the paper that, that I've, I've gone before the General Assembly trying to get some things changed for rural Georgia. But, but uh, hopefully we're going to get tested in, in our rural areas. We'll, we'll get breaks on, the, uh, on their ISO ratings, so they will help on the insurance rates. So there, there are five trucks in there, tankers, to, to even help us have more more water in the county, and that's the big thing is, is to get more water. Where you, when you respond, you have enough water to to, uh, to fight the fire. So uh, there's a long list of things that's on the splice, and it and I'll just read some of them. Uh, the, there's going to be a we, we're going to try to do a 911 building. The 911 now is is in the jail when the jail was built in the in the mid 80s. The 911 center was put in there. It's kind of a bad situation. I don't know if anybody that's got their uh, 911 center inside the jail with the prisoners somehow took over the, the jail. They would also take over our 911 center. So we want to try to get it out of our, our jail. And, and, and in the past, we the city actually administered uh, 911, and now the county is administering. But, but in the past, uh, the city actually had workers that were working, you know, with our workers. So it was it was kind of a, you know, awkward situation there. You know, they were on a different pay scale and all this stuff. So it was, we, we're trying to get that corrected. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to get the prison detail, the construction detail to, to help build build it. Like they have many things that they built. They built Athens Tech and, and a lot of other things for us. And hopefully, we're going to get them back to, to help do that. Uh, we, the list of things on there is vehicles for fire, EMS, and sheriff. The, the libraries is some money in there. It's a 4-H van. It's money for recreation. I think the Little League field is the main thing. Likes the Little League field. The hospital has been in every splash we've had, uh, and, and it's you know it's a good way to help our hospital. Uh, and the hospital is really important for for the job to help they have and for. You know, a small community to have a hospital is, is really important. Uh, it's stuff for elections. There's some voting machines, uh, solid waste. There's some equipment, airport. I mean, it, it's a it's a it's a big list of things that are in there. So it it can affect everybody. Roads and bridges is in it. We're always trying to get more money to to do our roads and bridges and. Uh, you know, it's, we never get enough money from the state to help us. They keep raising the, 
the weight limits on trucks that keep tearing our roads up, and uh, we have to somehow try to fix the worst ones. We don't ever get caught up, we just fix the worst ones. So uh, the spots is really important. Uh, I think I've probably talked over my time limit, so uh, if y'all have any questions about the spots, please contact me, uh, and uh, I will be glad to explain anything that I left out. So thank y'all for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we begin with the introduction of the candidates, I want to talk to you just briefly about the procedures of the forum. Um, the, the forum is not a debate, and you know, in the in the last 12 months, we've seen a lot of debates on television where people were. It seemed like the questioners were trying to make the candidates look bad. That's not the purpose of this debate at all. Uh, it's, it's not a debate, it's actually a forum. We, we don't intend to make anybody look bad. Uh, we're, we're only here so that you can meet the candidates and find out about them and gain some information about them. I want to point out to you that there is some campaign literature that's displayed on a table at the rear of the building. Um, and I, I put something back there from Mildred Peeler, who's our clerk of court and couldn't be with us tonight. So I, and I, there's quite a bit of it back there. You can find out more about the candidates through that. Uh, one, of the, one of the primary rules that we have is there's not going to be any direct interaction with, with the audience or between the candidates. Uh, it wouldn't work very well for us to do it. And, and again, we're not trying to make anybody look bad. We're just here so that you can meet the candidates and get some information about them. All the interaction with the candidates and by the candidates will be through the moderator. Uh, also, we, we want to encourage all the candidates and urge them to, to speak on topic, answer the questions uh, that are given to them, and, and uh, if you get off topic, we may... Uh, bring that to your attention and ask you to get back on order, get back on the topic, talking about order. Um, each candidate with opposition is going to be allotted two minutes for their opening comments and two minutes for their closing comments, while the candidates without opposition are going to be granted two minutes to speak and tell you about themselves. All right, um, it's time for the introduction of the candidates, and we're going to this, we're going to call the Senate candidates first, and we're, ladies and gentlemen, we're calling them in alphabetical order. Uh, we, we figured that was the only fair way to do it. So our first Senate candidate for Senate District 24 is Lee Anderson. So, Mr. Anderson, if you would take the stage, you have a couple of minutes to tell everybody about yourself and what you'd like to accomplish here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us here today. Thank you for putting this meeting on so people can get educated about the people that's running for office. I feel like I'm already connected. I know I'm connected with Wilkes County because I do business in Wilkes County. I do business at Wilkes Stockyard, Palmer's Equipment, and construction companies here in Wilkes County. I've been a former state representative that served part of Wilkes County, and it was an honor to serve you in Atlanta. I'm asking you for your vote and support to go back to Atlanta and go to the State Senate in District 24. Some of the issues, main number one issue has always been my main, main issue is public safety, making our people the most safe as possible. Number two, education. Hire the best teachers possible and then get out of the way and let them teach our children. We have to build the roads, bridges, and infrastructure. I've had the honor to be part of the, the uh, progress that's on Highway 17 right now from Thompson to Washington. We can put the infrastructure in place then get out of the way and let businesses create jobs and not go. We also need to work on ways to make inmates in our prisons be have other alternatives to go to to where it won't cost you and I tax dollars for them in prison, but also turn their lives around at the same time. 
uh, the chairman here, Sam Moore, they have a problem that where we, the state, they send the, the money, sales tax money to Atlanta, and we send it back. And there's no way that they know what's coming back. I'm going to change that so that they know exactly what they get back. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> Our next candidate for the state senate office is Joe Edge. Well, thank you for having us here this afternoon. Uh, I'm a little different than probably most of the people up here in that I am not a politician. Uh, I'm a businessman. I started my own business when I was 23 years old. Uh, after four years in the Marine Corps, I have a strong heart for economic development. Uh, the main reason is that uh, I want my children to live here. You know, I have four children. I want them to live in this district. I want their children to live in this district. But in order to do so, there's got to be jobs. There's got to be a diversity. You know, we have no engineering jobs here. You know, you, you can go to tech, you can go to Southern, uh, you can even go to UGA and get a, an engineering degree, but if they want to move back here, they can't get a job. So in my business, which is Sherman and Hem Street, it's a commercial real estate firm, I've had a lot of direct interaction with industry. I have experience going out and recruiting industry to relocate in this area. Uh, I understand the challenges, uh, the, the, the problems with infrastructure, rail, all of these issues. I have a detailed plan on how I'm going to bring jobs to this district. Uh, you know, and don't be fooled, right? Every politician says, and this drives me nuts, every politician says, I'm going to lower taxes, I'm going to bring jobs to the district. Okay, that's great. Ask them how. Specifically, how are you going to do that? Or is that just a tagline designed to get votes? I have a specific plan on how I'm going to alter the job tax credit law, a specific plan on how I'm going to recruit out-of-state industry to come into the district. Because right now, the way our tax system is set up, Tennessee and Florida is killing us. South Carolina is even killing us, especially with the border communities. We just can't compete. We are, we are losing industry to Aiken, Anderson, and all those counties over in South Carolina. You know, if we don't do something, if we don't elect somebody that can give us a competitive edge in Atlanta, you know, we're going to continue to lose jobs in this area. And that's, that's something that I'm passionate about, and it's something that I believe that I can fix. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hayes. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, the next candidate that we're going to hear from is Peter Gibbons. Good evening. My name is Pete Gibbons. I've been the mayor of Bowman, uh, just up the road here in Albert County for the last few years. I served a term as city council member before that. So I've, I've learned government from the ground up. I've learned government in an area very similar to Washington and Wilkes uh, County. Uh, Albert and Wilkes, we've got a lot of similar issues, a lot of, uh, a lot of issues that we need to fight for. And I've already fought for them. I've been fighting for them for the last few years. Whether it's a need for economic development and growth, whether it's a fight to keep our rural hospital open, those are issues and challenges challenges that I've been facing for the last five plus years, and those are the issues that I'm ready to fight for in Wilkes County. Uh, again, uh, my name is Pete Gibbons. I definitely love y'all's support and vote. Uh, you please feel free to look me up on my website, www.gibbonsforsenate.com. Feel free to look me up on Facebook, facebook.com slash Pete Gibbons for GA. Uh, I definitely do love to do whatever I can to win y'all's support and vote. Thank you very much. And now we're going to call on Pat Goodwin. And there is a staircase over here to help well, us step I, up. That's, that's I saw him. Uh, you know, I saw him trying to do the joke about that. I don't know if they have a lot of staircases. <laughs> Thank you. You're a good gentleman. I mean, excuse me, Miss Goodwin. Uh, that's a that's a portable mic, and you can adjust it or just take it in your hand like this if you like. Oh, fine. I think it's fine. Everyone can hear me in the back. Yeah, can you hear me in the back? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your help, Mr. Lee. So, and thank you to all of you for being here because I know it takes time out of your schedule. Well, I'm Pat Goodwin, and I'm running for the state senate. Um, I'm a conservative Republican, and I'm not uh, a politician. I am truly a community servant. 
What I bring to the table is over 40 years of experience. I've worked at the Southern Company for 29 years and then at the Medical College of Georgia for 13. The last two years, I actually um, have been dabbling a little bit in real estate as Director of Community Relations, and now I'm trying to learn more about it just to help me to, as I progress along through life. Um, my passion, of course, is, um, well, let me back up. Let me tell you something. I noted when I drove through uh, Wilkes County a couple weeks ago, it was something very obvious to me. It was the homes for sale. So that tells me that there's something going on here. There's either a company is shut down or people are leaving. And the way I'm with Joe on this, I believe that the way we keep people here is we got to give them opportunities. And opportunities means we need assessments of what our communities can do best. What do we have to offer other people? And uh, that's where you do go to work with the Economic Development Department. I believe in good highways and the transit system. And I'm excited as I travel up 17, uh, going towards Athens to see the expansion on the highways, because I think that just positions this area to, um, so much better for the transit systems. And I say transit meaning trucks and anything else that could be going back that way to get 85. Uh, the other thing I have a passion for is I love to um, I love to see more dedicated career technical high schools. You know, in education, one size doesn't fit all. Not every child is ready for college when they come out, and there's certainly nothing wrong with trade schools. And a lot of our communities are building those. So I would look forward to helping make that happen. And if you elect me, I will do so. So thank you. Everybody. My name is Greg Grabowski, and uh, I'm coming from Evans, Georgia, Columbia County. An election is really about trust, isn't it? So I've got about a minute and a few seconds to earn your trust or start that process. But we need to think of it that way. You know, what kind of person are you putting in the office? Can you trust this person to do things that they don't know they're going to have to do six, seven, eight months from now, right? So I'm a retired Army officer. I retired out of Fort Gordon last year, 23 years in service. I'm a father, I have four girls, 16, 13, 12, and 10. My wife and I are very busy. But I've been committed, very committed, to what we always hear about in this presidential election, our Constitution. I mean, it's not crazy for me to say how much I love it, because I do. I've lived it my entire life. Right from college, I went into the Army. And I've been a soldier all my life, and I'll be a soldier until the day I die. When I was in Iraq, I had some time to really think about, reflect on what we were fighting for, and I put those ideas down. I spent a lot of time in my life, I was a history major, I spent a lot of time thinking about where our country's come from and where it's going. And I put those ideas down, and I'm going to leave this here for you folks. And I wrote this in 2010 when I was sitting in Iraq, about what we need to do as Americans to protect our country, to keep our freedom. It's about empowering citizens. Our nation is great because you guys are great. That's why we're great. Not because of our president, not because of our senators, but because each and every American has talent. And what the government should be doing is empowering citizens to realize that talent. Whether it's a businessman, a soldier, a teacher, <coughs> let them be innovative. So what I'm about is limited government, limited taxation, to empower the counties, to allow that innovation, to allow citizens to become what they want to become and not be stifled by bureaucracy. I can tell you now, on the outside, as a contractor for the Department of Defense, it's nothing but your honors, and you have to know how to fight through it. So I hope tonight I'll earn your trust, and, and you'll uh, start believing that I'm the man for the job for the Senate. Thank you very much. start. My name is Brenda Jordan. I'm from Hart County. I'm a retired educator. I have a Bachelor of Science degree from Georgia Southern College, that's a university. I have a Master's and Specialist degree from the University of Georgia. I have a degree from Clemson University of Special Education. I served as a teacher for 23 years, assistant principal, 
for eight years and then began uh, to be assistant principal and vocational director. I was over curriculum and instruction. You're wondering, what can you do for us? I'm here to serve you and your community. I'm from rural Georgia. I know what it's like for us to be on the edge of everything. But let me tell you what's happening in your area. You're going to see one of the expansions of this county and every county going down 17 because it is going to be called Interstate 3. It goes from Chattanooga all the way down to Savannah. That's the reason they're widening these roads. It's not to make it comfortable for you, but the interstate is coming. Also, the deepening of the port in Savannah will also put 100 semi-trucks on I-20 every area. The governor has got to put in four railroad hubs from here, from, from Augusta all the way up to North Georgia. If you don't know about this, you may want to get in on it. Also, you need to think about, <coughs> excuse me, you need to think about Cyber Command in Augusta. It's employed over 30,000 people in the last two years. The people are coming. If you go down to Lincolnton, you see people grading land and they're selling it off to build houses for those folks. People commute here every day to Augusta. Think about jobs. Think about education. What is our technical schools going? What is your high school technical education training your kids? What they did like in the 80s and the 90s when they were learning woodwork and when they were learning how to do metals and all this that could help them in the future. We gotta think about this for our children. We gotta think about getting a good education. And let me tell you something, as your senator, I will promote, support, education, agriculture, public service personnel. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Why don't you use the steps right over here? I sure will. Judge Roger Dunaway is retiring, and both of these gentlemen are from Thompson. Again, alphabetically, we're going to call on our first candidate is Britt Hammond. Thank you. Good evening. Um, it's a privilege to be here. My name is Britt Hammond. I'm running for Superior Court Judge of the Tomb Circuit. Uh, the first thing I would want to let you know about me is that I'm a Christian, and my highest purpose in life is to honor God with my life. I believe in, in seeking this job, I'm furthering what I believe to be my calling, which is the protection of children and the preservation of families. Uh, and I have been blessed with a lot of experiences uh, in my career. I have served as a county attorney. I have served as a public defender. I have, represent, I have prosecuted civil abuse and neglect cases as a special assistant attorney general. And I have represented individual clients in just about every type of action there is, from bankruptcy to personal injury, a workers' compensation to real estate. Um, but my calling, uh, I believe, is serving uh, children and families. The last 12 years, I have served as your circuit-wide juvenile court judge, and I have worked tirelessly in that position to make the communities better in that position. We apply for local grants. Uh, set up programs to set up community collaboratives. I have three times been honored uh, on the state level once and twice nationally for judicial leadership in this area. And if you elect me as your next Superior Court judge, I will commit to you all of my passion, energy, and heart to make th that court work for you and this community. Thank you. Thank you, whoever kept clapped. Uh, <laughs> 55 years ago, uh, I was born in Washington, Georgia. Went home, and my daddy and my mama were going to call me Bryant, but my sister had another idea, so she called me Bubba, so that's where I'd come up with Bubba. So uh, on the ballot, you'll see Bryant Bubba Swan. Uh, I lived my whole life in Thompson, Georgia. I spent a lot of time in Washington visiting my grandmother, Hazel Lucas. I, lo I love Washington. I've always, always had a special place in my heart uh, for this town. Every time during my 30-year career I got to come up here, uh, I'd ride around and look and reminisce, and it was, it, it was wonderful. It took me back to my childhood. I graduated from Thompson High School, went off to Mercer University, got my law degree there, uh, came back to Thompson. I've practiced law there for 30 years now. Uh, I, I've had a wide... Uh, ranging uh, small town practice. For the first 20 years or so, I took appointed criminal cases. I've tried hundreds of cases, uh, ranging from you know murder cases, child molestation, down to to uh, traffic tickets. Uh, 
Twelve years ago, I was appointed to, the, to be the chief master judge in McDevitt County. Uh, that put me on the other side of the, of the bench. Uh, we also try all kind of cases. That is a wide-ranging office, as Judge Green can tell you. We handle criminal cases. We handle small claims. We handle dispossessories. So I have a vast amount of experience. Uh, and one thing that I'm uh, most proud of with that experience is, is that uh, about twice a year, our Superior Court judges have to leave town. Every time they leave town, there has to be a Superior Court judge in the circuit, so they appoint me to sit in for them. So I think I have their, their confidence. Uh, I don't want to skip over the fact that, uh, and I, I see my wife sitting over here, I, I did get married at some point. Uh, we've been married uh, for 31 years, uh, and two children. Uh, my son is married, and, and, and 15 months ago gave me the apple of my eye, a grandchild. Uh, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a family man, and I just appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swan. Now we turn to our candidates for the Office of District Attorney for the Toombs Judicial Circuit, and we're going to call on Woody Davis first. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Woody Davis, and I welcome the opportunity to talk with you about my candidacy for District Attorney of this circuit. I'm running for this office for a number of reasons, uh, primarily because I, I love what I do. I have a passion for being a prosecutor, and much uh, like has been said before, I'm a career prosecutor and not much of a politician. I'm a politician out of necessity at this point. Uh, now, I can also tell you that I'm the most experienced candidate running for district attorney. And I will tell you this, too, that in a criminal setting and in a criminal courtroom, experience matters. Folks, I have been a trial lawyer for 36 years. Of those years, I have been an assistant district attorney for 24. And of those years, I have been your chief assistant district attorney for 22 years. Uh, folks, uh, as chief assistant, uh, it's more than a title. I'm second in command of the district attorney's office, and it would appear then that I have been apprenticing for 22 years to be your next elected district attorney. Now, as far as trial experience is concerned, uh, I, I have been involved with the only two death penalty cases that we've had in this circuit in the last 22 years. I have tried cases in each of the six counties, both in front of the jury, and I prosecuted defendants in each of the six counties. Uh, anything from uh, felony murder to armed robbery to child molestation, uh, frankly, all the way down to jaywalking and speeding. We handle it all in our circuit, so we don't, uh, we don't have two separate court systems for felonies and misdemeanors. Folks, in personal note, I've been awakened in the middle of the night, sent out to crime scenes that would make angels cry. But through it all, it has been a very rewarding experience for me to represent and protect the citizens of this circuit, and it is my heartfelt desire to continue to do so for the rest of my term. Well, good evening, everybody, and I thank everyone for coming out tonight and listening to us. My name is Bill Dupay, and I am on the Democratic ticket for the office of the district attorney. I have been your senior assistant district attorney assigned to Wilkes County for my entire 18 years in this circuit. I am proud of the work that I have done in our courtroom over the 18 years, trying virtually every jury trial that's been tried for the last 18 years. I'm proud of the work that I have done to make Wilkes County a safer place. I, too, have tried a variety of cases. I've tried cases ranging from murder to armed robbery, child molestation, drug dealing, fishing game, dog fighting, animal cruelty, cruelty, and on down the list. And I've done so in a fair, just, and efficient manner. But I believe our office can do more. And if I am elected, I will do more. If I am elected, I envision an office where we will be more involved in your community. We will be more involved with your schools. When asked, we will be more involved with your children, with your churches, and we will be more accessible to the public here in Wilkes County. And to do that, my vision is rather simple. We need to work together as a community, not just in the courtroom, but in the community outside of the courtroom, working together shoulder to shoulder to promote justice, fairness, and public safety. I'm 53 years old. I feel real young. I've got a lot of energy, and I have a passion about my vision and how to accomplish this. 
I've been a prosecutor. I've been a prosecutor here in Wilkes County for 18 years. I have been in a criminal court setting trying cases for my entire legal career, which is 27 years, getting out of law school in 1989. I also have a long-standing history of using my talents and my skill set in the community on a volunteer basis to make my community in McDuffie County better. I've coached Little League ball for 14 years, coached a variety of other sports. I've been on the recreation board in Thompson for 10 years. I've been involved with our hospital board for 13 years. I'm the current chairman of the board for University Hospital McDuffie. So I have a firm belief and passion that I need to use my skills to promote uh, what we do, and I will continue to work, if elected, to make Wilkes County a safer place. Thank you very much. The next office is the office of Wilkes County Tax Commissioner, and we're going to call on candidate Lisa Dozier first. and I work in the Wilkes County Tax Commissioner's Office. I've been in that Lisa, office. Lisa, if you would stand closer to the microphone and speak directly into it because the folks in the back probably can't hear you. Okay, I'll start over. <laughs> Real quick. Real like so? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Lisa Dozier and I work in the Wilkes County Tax Office. I've been working in that office for about 16 years now. Um, I do everything in the office. Uh, issue tags, do titles, assist Miss Mary when distributions. I'm really nervous. You'll have to forgive me. Um, I just lost it all. Okay. Are you married? Actually, I am. Um, <laughs> I'm married and I have um, six children and um, ten grandkids. I'm busy. Um, I grew up in, um, my speech is all messed up, y'all, I'm sorry. I grew up in Tegnal. Um, I served in the United States Air Force for about six years. And um, once I got out of the Air Force, I went to work for Ms. Mary. I'm sorry. I would just appreciate your support. Thank you. Our next candidate for the Office of Tax Commissioner is Dean Hubbard. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for my opportunity to talk tonight. Again, I would, I would encourage you to speak directly into the mic. Okay. Thank you. I want to make sure everybody can hear. All right. For those of you that don't know my name, my name is Dean Hubbard. I'm a Democrat candidate for the Wilkes County Tax Commissioner's Office. I'm 47, and I'm a lifelong resident of Wilkes County. I'm a Christian. I grew up at First Baptist Church, where I was the president of Youth Council, and now I attend New Life Baptist Church. Um, I am currently employed and have been for 13 years with McLean Southeast. It's a nationwide food grocery distribution center. I've been around the tax office for six, six since I was six years old, and the early part, my uncle Grady Rogers was tax commissioner, so I would do small jobs to help. Um, after I turned 18, I helped my mom, Mary Hubbard. Which is, a previous, which is the present tax commission now, do jobs, you know. I was not allowed to work, per se, with her because that's not politically correct. So um, I know the duties and responsibilities of the tax office. I know the importance of taxpayers making the tax returns and making sure they do it right. I know the process of the assessment letter and that they have 45 days to get it. To appeal it, um, I know the I know who to send the people to when they do question it if their assessment's wrong. I have a good relationship with the assessor's office, and um, I know how to I know the process of collecting property, timber, mobile home tax, and how to distribute the funds between the state, school, and the county. 
I have a good relationship with Rick Baxter and Mark White, who is the owners of Appalachian Mountain Services, who is a collection company that collects delinquent taxes. Um, and I think that's very important when people need to make a payment plan because times get hard. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hubbard. Uh, so we're going to call on Mark Moore first. Good evening. I'm Mark Moore. I'm the, I'm the Wilkes County Sheriff and uh, seeking my third term. Sheriff Moore, if I could remind you about the mic, please. Pull it out. You can pull it out if you like. I'm seeking my third term as uh, Sheriff of Wilkes County. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Wilkes County. I'm a graduate of the Wilkes County school system. I attended uh, Abraham Baldwin College and uh, uh, obtained an uh, associate's science degree in law enforcement and attended uh, and graduated from Georgia Southern College in Statesboro, Georgia, and uh, received a Bachelor of Science degree in criminal justice. I'm also a graduate of the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia in 1980. I've attended and completed a, and training in over 100 specialized law enforcement training courses with over 3,000 in-service training hours. And, uh, during my career from various regional, state, and federal law enforcement training academies, including the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, the United States Secret Service, the Georgia Public Safety Training Center, and other professional uh, training academies. I'm a graduate of the 2008 uh, Georgia Sheriff's Select Academy. Um, I'm a small weapons expert and instructor is certified by the FBI, the United States Secret Service, the Georgia Public Safety Training Center, the Georgia Post Training Council, the United States Practical Shooting Confederation, and other world-renowned firearms authorities. My work history includes from 1974 through 2000. I was employed by Wilkes County Sheriff's Office as investigator, criminal uh, deputy sheriff and chief deputy from 2000 to 2004. Uh, Green County Sheriff's Office as Deputy Sheriff, Criminal Investigator and Training Officer from 2005 to 2008. I'm supported by the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office as uh, Deputy Sheriff, Captain and Investigator. And I've served as the Sheriff of Wills County since 2009. My work experience includes 40 years of law enforcement uh, work, uh, 26 of which was in this community. I've investigated literally thousands of cases and, and, and prosecuted hundreds of cases in, in criminal court. Uh, and I uh, have experience in, in management, policy making, and in, in the. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, we'll have some questions later, and you can expand on that. Now we're going to call on Greg Rogers. Good evening. I'm Greg Rogers. I've worked for the Sheriff's Department in Wilkes County for over 30 years. And uh, I like to be involved with the uh, community more than what we are now, with the school. I've helped with Little League, uh, coaching Little League for, since my kids were little. I'm married, Allison Rogers. And uh, I would just like to say it would be an honor if I get elected to be the sheriff to serve you, you would be my boss. I would love to meet with you. If you have any questions, anything, I will talk to you and we could work it out. Uh, I will be a working sheriff. I won't be sitting in office. I'll be out with my deputies and I would love to uh, get my deputies trained in whatever we need to get trained in to be more accessible and knowledge to everybody. And like I say, it will be an honor to be this year for Wills County. Thank you. Thank you. And our final candidate for a contested office is Mr. Esper Lee, who is a candidate for a District 1 County Commission seat. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I am Esther Lee. I wish that my son would have been here. I. Uh, 
Uh, I shouldn't have started that way. Okay, <laughs> forgive me. Many of you know me in many different capacities. I talk many of you, and I don't want you to stand, but many of you know me as your classroom teacher. I hope you don't hold that against me now, <laughs> because I taught some of the difficult classes. I taught physics, I taught calculus, I taught geometry, and I must say that uh, I taught uh, attorney hard. <laughs> he was a great student, and my, my two minutes are going to be up before I know it, but I taught uh, Mr. Jackson advanced mathematics, and I hope that the grades that they received, I hope they don't vote accordingly or uh, if the grades weren't uh, uh, real uh, well. But uh, I finished high school here uh, uh, at the age of 16. I finished college at the age of 20. I went on to earn a, a Master's of Arts degree from Oregon State University. I later, a couple of years, three years later, I attended the uh, University of Georgia where I received an EDS degree uh, in math education. Uh, I've been an educator practically all of my life with the exception of working with my wife, Bessie, who's back in the audience there as a funeral director. I believe it or not, I have to help out with that because my son was an informant mortician. My daughter's a back there. <laughs> I didn't turn it on. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Let me tell them how old I am. That's okay. <laughs> We're going to introduce the unopposed candidates to you. They're, they're going to tell you a little, about, a little bit about themselves and what they do and what their what their roles entail. Uh, we're going to begin the forum questions with the Senate candidates. And again, we're just going to go in alphabetical order uh, as we did the first time. So this is the and we're going to give everybody an opportunity to answer these questions. Uh, the first question will be for Lee Anderson. Again, we're just going in alphabetical order. So, Mr. Anderson, if you'd like to take the stage. One of the most significant issues facing rural towns in Georgia is the continued vitality of their local hospitals. Hospitals draw potential business and residents from the community. Excuse me, too. In Mills County, residents feel safe and secure with the level of service that they receive from Mills Memorial Hospital. However, that level of service requires money. Recently, the state legislature passed House Bill 919, the Rural Hospital Tax Credit Bill, which provides tax credits for donations to rural health care. This is a start, but more may be needed. Do you think that the tax credit bill will encourage investment in rural hospitals? And part two, what do you, what can you do in the state legislature to support rural hospitals and provide further financial assistance? Very good question. I'll, like I go back to my first issue, is to keep the people safe and also as healthy as possible. We need to make sure rural Georgia is took care of and a, a good health the community. We, uh, we also need to make sure that the people here has the opportunity to have doctors on standby that's on a film. They may be in South Georgia, but if you've got a person here in Wilkes County that's having a stroke, that person needs the best professional help possible within minutes. We have a program to where you, we can have doctors maybe in South Austin that's on a, that can get in touch 
with the people that's right here in Wilkes to make sure that that person gets the health care that they need within minutes. We need to push this more and more and more. I had the opportunity to work with it when I was a state representative. And that's one of the key issues that we need to do is have the most best doctors. To, they may be in Atlanta. They may be in Albany. But have them where we can get in touch with them when we have an emergency. And that's the way it needs to be done. And I thank you for the question. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. And our next candidate is Joe Edge. Mr. Edge, if you would come forward. And uh, to refresh your recollection, I'm going to repeat the question. Okay. It's a little, little complicated. Uh, recently, the state legislature passed House Bill 919, which is the Rural Hospital Tax Credit Bill. And that provides tax credits for donations to rural health care. Uh, do you think the tax credit bill will encourage investment in rural hospitals? And what can you do in the state legislature to support rural hospitals and provide further financial assistance? Sure. Well, I'm glad I've actually read the bill, first of all. Uh, yeah, I've, had a, I've had a conversation about this bill, actually, with uh, several uh, medical lobbyists uh, that called me about it. But, yes, absolutely, I believe the bill is a good thing, and I believe it will help rural hospitals. Uh, tax credits are a very complex structure. Uh, I have a lot of experience dealing with it on the economic development side, but particularly on the hospital side, the biggest problem that you have is that a doctor, like somebody graduates high school, goes off to college, medical school that's from here, moves back, and they can't make as good a living as if they lived in Augusta or Savannah. So, you know, it's hard for them to stay here and make a living. This program, I think, helps solve some of that. In addition, uh, the whole medical industry in general is consolidating. You know, the, these doctors are merging in with, with other practices. We see it all the time. And so that leaves the rural Georgia areas left without good doctors, really. Uh, and so you got to be real careful not to get bit by a snake up here. But, you know, really the issue is this. We have to continue to increase the taxes, increase the tax incentives that go to doctors in rural Georgia so that they want to stay here, they want to go back to their hometown, live there, and work there. Otherwise, they're going to move somewhere else. And, and it is a real problem. Thank you, Mr. H. We appreciate that. And now we're going to call on Pete Gibbons. Mr. Gibbons, to repeat the question, to refresh your recollection, the state legislature has passed House Bill 919, Rural Hospital Tax Credit Bill, and it provides tax credits for donations to rural health care. Uh, do you think this tax credit bill will encourage investment in rural hospitals, and what could you do to help in the rural, uh, in the state legislature to support rural hospitals? Sure. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, our local rural hospitals are very dear and important to our communities. I think uh, HB 919 will help, uh, but it doesn't go far enough. We need to do more to support our local hospitals. Uh, without a hospital here in our community, you know, it, it'll kill our economic development. It'll kill, you know, more residents moving to this area. You know, it's, it's one of the first things that businesses look for when they move to a community is that someone gets hurt on the job. Is there going to be adequate health care for, you know, for them to be taken care of? In Elbert County, I've been working hard with, you know, we put together a team. Our local and county governments worked with our hospital to make sure that they stayed open. We fought tooth and nail uh, with, to keep that hospital open. We were able to get uh, a partnership with AnMed Health from Anderson, South Carolina. Was able to come in, help uh, keep our hospital going. It was very close to closing several years ago, and we were able to fight to keep it open. As mayor, I also worked with uh, MedLink and Tycott Healthcare to not only keep our medical facility open in the city of Bowman, but to expand it and work for grants to improve it. Uh, so we made sure, you know, our hospital was open. We made sure we had a medical center so we can have low income health care and we can have health care for our entire community. And that's what we need to do to make sure that Wilkes County has the same uh, benefits as we have in Elbert County. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're going to call on Pat Goodwin now. And Ms. Goodwin, if you would address this question about House Bill 919, which provides tax credits for donations to rural health care. And uh, we just want to ask what you can do to uh, encourage investment in rural hospitals, and what should the state legislature do to support rural hospitals? 
Well, it would be easy for me to say ditto on some of the other comments, but um, having worked at the Medical College of Georgia, what I have seen them do is they actually have formed partnerships across the state of Georgia where they are, are working with the rural hospitals and having students that are assigned to those hospitals. So they're upping the staff and uh, they're increasing a lot of their departments. Like uh, Lee was talking about a stroke. We have telemedicine where the, if a person has a stroke and they are at some location in the state, all they've got to do is use your cell phone to actually, with the physician, to dial back in, and then you have a professional or a specialist who's looking at that and, and giving the direction. So we're doing a lot of those things. But for me personally, it's a lot about those partnerships. I think we can do a lot, and we have a lot of students who are willing to come out and work under the supervision of physicians. In other areas, maternal fetal medicine. We have a lot of women with high-risk pregnancies. We need that uh, that area looked into. So I would work hard to to get some uh, communications going and try to find some workable solutions for these counties. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now we're going to call the <laughs> Mr. Grabowski, Hospital 919, the Rural Hospital Tax Credit Bill provides tax credits for donations for rural health care. And the question is, do you think that the tax credit bill will encourage investment in rural hospitals? And what could you do in the state legislature to support rural hospitals? Thank you for the question. I'm going to come at it a little bit differently. Um, absolutely support uh, rural areas of Georgia, just any rural area across the country that are always disadvantaged. I grew up in the countryside as well. And it was a challenge, actually, it was a discussion that happened in Columbia County during the commission race last time about building a hospital in our district at the time. There's a lot of issues. The main issue is this, and this is what it's going to come down to, I think, in the legislature. There's a lot of solutions we can look at, but somebody has to pay for that, right? And I believe that as a state, the state has a responsibility, and certainly a senator who covers areas where there's a lot of economic development, as in Columbia County, and other areas that are not as blessed as that, that wealth has to be spread around a little bit. That's not a popular thing to say in Columbia County, okay? But the reality is we are all citizens of this state, okay? As a service member, that's the way we approach it in the military. There are times when you have resources, there's times when you don't have resources, but you don't leave somebody behind. And that's what this is really about. So it's about partitioning the resources, money, okay, that Georgia has, there's only so much. And I do believe with an aging population, and we're going to see a lot more of that in the state of Georgia, especially in this area, especially around Fort Gordon, which is a major military hub for medicine. We're going to see a lot of that. There's, they're predicting 20 to 30 million people over the course of 20 to 30 years that are going to migrate into the southeast, and they're going to congregate in areas like here. And they're going to need those kind of health care benefits. And so I absolutely do believe in that. And there's going to be a combination of activities that need to occur in order to expand existing resources and provide more advanced medicines. And the way you have to do that is, once I said before in my conversation, was empower local counties. Give the counties what they need, and design the hospitals the best way they can, and the resources, the money to do it, and don't control all of it at the state level. I believe that's a key to success across all the counties. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Jordan, the uh, House Bill 919 relates to tax credits for donations to rural health care. Do you think the tax credit bill will encourage investment in rural hospitals? And what could you do in the state legislature to support rural hospitals? How many minutes do I have? It is a good bill, but let me explain something to you. I'm from rural Georgia. You're from rural Georgia. The best thing you and I have for us right now is our EMS systems in all six counties that I'm politicking in. None of you probably want to hear this, but when the non-expansion of Medicaid took place, Georgia has lost $275 million in tax revenue. Four people died daily because of lack of health care. Why? Why does that happen to happen? Do you have people that's going to come and donate to your hospital? Do we have people who's going to donate to one they just built on I-85 that almost closed, fed into St. Mary's? Think about it. Who's going to donate? What company's coming here? Some big corporation that somebody knows is going to come in and take it over? This is your hospital just like our hospital was. Tell, tell uh, the telephone thing they're talking about, where you get on, you see everything. That's great. 
But if you're in your car going down the road, you don't have reception, what are you going to do? 30 miles of Lincoln County has no reception at all. I know, I've been there. Think about it. What's our next steps? By 2018, the money that your hospital has, the money that other rural hospitals have, will be gone. More hospitals will be closing in this state. If you have a heart attack, you got from five to seven minutes to get help, unless somebody knows CPR. I will work with your county government, your city government, anytime, day or night. The lady that comes with me to help me will tell you I get four hours sleep a night. I'm always up doing things. Look on my card, look on my website. My health is important to me, just like yours is. If you have a parent in a nursing home and they're on Medicare, guess what? Two years ago, when all this went through with non-expansion, your parents did not receive Medicaid in the nursing home, and they can't get some extra stuff that they need. Thank you, Ms. Thank Jordan. That's two minutes. Thanks Thank very much. <laughs> second question for the Senate candidates, um, and again we'll do it the same way alphabetically. Uh, this question involves the rising cost of homeowners insurance. Uh, uh, recently, Wills County Commission Chairman Sam Moore raised an important issue regarding the cost of uh, homeowners insurance in rural areas. The issue revolves around the fairness or unfairness of insurance rate hikes based on the distance from fire stations. As Chairman Moore has pointed out, emergency vehicles can cover five miles faster in Wilkes County than they can in a mountainous area or an urban area. And Chairman Moore has spoken to several state officials regarding introduction of legislation that would make changes to the insurance rating procedure so that it does not continue to discriminate against rural counties. If elected, would you be willing to support that type of legislation? And we're going to call on Lee Anderson again. Uh, I have worked with your chairman quite often in the past, and I'll work with your chairman in the future. He knows that when we have issues, that I pick up the phone and I call him, and that we communicate whatever the issue is. If you, the chairman thinks that this is a good issue for your area, then I'm going to work with you because it's your, your community, your people. But at the same time, I go back to what I said at the beginning about infrastructure. We must get infrastructure in place. And that not only helps build businesses, but it also makes it to where you will have a better homeowner's rating on the insurance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Edge, now. Mr. Edge, the question relates to the rising cost of homeowner's insurance in rural areas and the possibility of introducing legislation that would make changes to the insurance rating procedure and whether or not you would be willing to support that type of legislation. Well, it's it's a complicated issue. It's, it's definitely not just something I think that somebody can stand up here and say yes or no on. Uh, being in real estate, I probably look at this a little differently. I'm a small government person, right? I do not believe that the government should get involved in regulating business uh, to a certain degree, right? I mean, so, some regulation is necessary, but my initial gut reaction would say no, that I probably would not support it. Because why should, I mean, this is something that would affect the entire state. And, you know, I just, I don't see another reason to tell the insurance companies how to do their job. Uh, but again, it's a very complex issue. Uh, you know, the distance from a fire station or the distance from a, a fire hydrant, things like that, should fa affect your insurance. I get that some towns are, are laid out differently. Uh, but again, one, one community should not be able to dictate 
you know, an entire policy for the state related to how the insurance companies calculate their premiums. I don't, I don't think that's equitable, and I don't think that's fair for the entire state. I mean, yeah, we represent this district, but we have to keep in mind that this is a state office. I mean, we, we are making decisions that are going to fe- affect the entire state. Now, infrastructure is important. You know, one of the biggest things that you can do is bring jobs to the area. Bringing jobs to the area, you'll get better infrastructure improvements. Uh, and, and with those improvements... Those reductions and those kinds of premiums and things will come, uh, but you first, everything revolves around industry, manufacturing, and jobs. You want lower insurance, you have to bring jobs. You want to eat somewhere other than Zaxby's and, and McDonald's, you've got to have jobs first. Then the retail comes. Then then you can solve some of these issues, but primarily, that's why this, this race is important, that's why this seat is important, because it's primarily related to economic development. We have to bring the jobs back to this area. Thank you, Mr. Eads. We appreciate that. And we call on Pete Gibbons now. Uh, Mr. Gibbons, the, the premise is emergency vehicles can cover five miles faster in Wilkes County than they could in a mountainous county or an urban county. And, the, and it relates to introducing legislation that would make changes in the insurance rating procedure so that it would continue to discriminate against rural counties. Would you be willing to support that type of legislation? Well, sure. Uh, as a mayor, I know the importance of our state legislators, our county government, and our municipal government working together. Uh, I think Sam and Ames will both know that you know I'll be a phone call away, I'm just up the road, and whenever they need to help, I'll be there to help them with it. Um, you know, I'll be more than happy to sit down and look, look at this with them, bring in our insurance commissioner and see what ways we can look at this to fix this issue. You know, we worked hard in Elbert County to bring uh, different uh, water systems in place that lowered our ISO rating, which helped uh, help our insurance rates. And I'd definitely be happy to work with Sam and Ames and, and the rest of our government here in Wilkes County to see what we can do to bring that kind of savings to our homeowners here in Wilkes County as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're going to call on Ms. Goodwin now. Ms. Goodwin, the, the question relates to how quickly an emergency vehicle can reach the property from the fire station and uh, in Wilkes County it could be done quicker than it could in a mountainous county or an urban county. And do you support legislation that would uh, change the way insurance ratings are made? I would support that. And reason being is that I'm watching a, a little bit of that happening in Columbia County where the, the county is coming in and putting in the water lines to get to the to the fire uh, poles so that they can be supported. So I, just a, a simple answer is yes, I would support it because you've already told me it can move quicker and it, we're talking about saving lives and families. So yes, I would support it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you be willing to support legislation if introduced that would change the way insurance ratings procedures are handled? Thank you for the question. Normally, I don't believe in government intrusion into the free enterprise market. There are times, however, when that does have to happen. So the criteria that we're talking about is critical among that bill is. That's absolutely what we have. Without that information, I couldn't say yes or no to that. We have to be careful. Some companies have left to their own devices will create a situation where we have huge economic hardship because, because of it. When the government has to step in and handle those, it, it needs to step in and do it, then it needs to step back out. The problem we have in our country is every time we step in, the government stayed in. Okay, and insurance is a delicate business, right? It's a cross between private ownership and economic and you know, entrepreneurs trying to make some money. If we were to do that, let's say we were to pass that criteria, that cost will be passed on to somebody. The cost will be passed to somebody to cover that home. So in fairness, you have to ask the question, is it right for someone to pay less here? And because of the risk down to the insurance company, they're going to pass that cost on to all the holders of those plans so that they can cover it, because that's what they'll do. And so as a government entity, you'd be very careful about that. So depending on how severe the situation is in the rural areas, that's where we have to look at what criteria we're talking about, and are we willing to take that risk and pass that cost on? Because the government will be responsible and not the company. So we have to really have a serious conversation about the criteria. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to call on Trina Jordan now. 
and ask the same question about supporting RIP legislation which would make changes to insurance rating procedures to help rural counties. Is that the same question you just, about the EMS, okay? I believe no, the no, ma'am, it's not EMS, it's fire. actually fire. Fire, gotcha, okay, yes. fire station. Oh, excuse yes, me, I'm sorry, I had my mind on something else. I would support the bill. And I'll tell you why. In our county, we were laying so many miles of water to go out to the county people so that their rates on the insurance will come down and they'll be protected by fire. We have fire stations located outside of our county. They've been working on this. If you live within, within five miles of a fire station, you're guaranteed your insurance will go down. I believe that we need to support this legislation. We need to protect our firemen. We need to make sure they can get the job done because you never know in a house if it's just a house or if there's a child there. Even if the EMS is going behind them, we make sure they can get there on time and do what they need to do. But there's ways of working with this, and I do support that legislation. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever had anything done on your house? Maybe a storm or whatever, something happens. You got a rate you've been playing for years, and all of a sudden, your rates go up because they had to pay to get your roof fixed. See, this, this is a big business trying to make us pay things that we shouldn't have to pay for if you're paying premiums all these years. Yes, I support it. We need to protect everybody in this room. We need to make sure the water's there, the fire station can get where they're going to in a hurry. Thank you, Ms. Curry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's the last question for the state senate candidates. We're going to change our procedures just slightly now. Uh, we have uh, a couple of questions for the Superior Court judge candidates, and Mr. Singleton, who is director of the Chamber of Commerce, is going to just hand them the microphone. And if you all will just remain seated, uh, or, or stand if you'd like, uh, then you can just answer these questions as you're seated. Uh, the first question is for Mr. Hammond. Um, Mr. Hammond, many, many members of the public did not ever see the inside of a courtroom, and the question is, if you could please give us a short explanation of how long a case typically takes to go through the legal system, and if you have any ideas about ways of shortening the time and cutting the cost to the public. Talk about a criminal or a civil case? Criminal. Uh, let's, let's address both of them. Well, the, the law is the way it is to protect the rights of citizens. Um, and to an extent, the length of that time is a result of the attorneys jostling for time. So I certainly think that judicial leadership can be used to, to truncate and slow that down, expedite it, make sure matters are handled expeditiously, join them together as much as possible, and to move cases along. That's certainly how I handle my court now. Uh, and I certainly will continue to work on that uh, as well. Dragging the case out in most types of cases does very little to serve the parties. So I think as quickly as the matters can be done, and once again, I believe the court can have a say in that uh, by judicial leadership, and I will exercise that. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Now, since you have the microphone, we're going to follow up with a second question. Um, if you would uh, tell the audience what you think is the most significant issue facing the court system today. I think it's a breakdown of the family, without a doubt. I think that issue, it really ripples out and affects almost everything that the court does. It is an absolute pipeline that we see where children are victimized by abuse and neglect. They become unruly, they become delinquent, and it leads to criminal conduct uh, and other broken families, other issues, and it's just a never-ending process. That's part of what our mandate in juvenile court to, uh, is to do, which I do currently, and that is to address preservation of families and addressing abuse and neglect and try to break that cycle. We try to get to the root cause to address that, but I think it's no doubt that's what the, the biggest challenge is. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now, we're going to shift our attention to Mr. Swan. Uh, Mr. Swan, the, the first question is, if you could uh, explain to the audience briefly uh, how long a case typically takes to go through the legal system and if there are any ways to shorten that time and cutting the cost to the public. Uh, right now, uh, it's difficult to start in 
my court. They started the English Supreme Court, started Magistrate Court, uh, and then they go uh, to Superior Court. And usually, what I see or the complaints I hear are that uh, there are delays and delays and delays. Uh, some of these are caused by things that can't be helped. I mean, obviously, uh, people have to give their lawyers, they have to prepare their cases, and those kind of things. But I do think with judicial leadership, uh, you can uh, shorten those times. I have seen so many people over the years that uh, come back court time and time and time again and are just so frustrated with the system. Uh, my brother-in-law had a, a simple case where he, he was given a bad check in his insurance agency. I think he came back to court about six times before the guy ended up being guilty. And uh, I don't know I don't know if there's anybody's fault there, but I think that as a Superior Court judge, if you're if you're running the uh, the courtroom, uh, you can uh, demand that uh, that those delays be reduced. Uh, I think people need to be prepared. Uh, like I said when they come in front of me now, uh, I, I warn them. You know, you need to go and get your lawyer. When you go in front of the judge the first time, the uh, He's going to ask you, do you have a lawyer? The answer he wants to hear is yes. I've talked to the public defender, or I've talked to uh, I hired a lawyer, and, and get ready to go. So I, so I think uh, there, should, there should be some, some constraints there. Thank you. And the second question is, uh, your opinion of the most significant issue facing the court system today? Once again, there, there are two sides to this. There's the civil side and there's the criminal side. Uh, we, we tend, I think, to leave out the civil and just talk about criminal. But on the civil side, uh, you deal with people at their worst. You deal with divorces, uh, things like that, child custody. Uh, so the, 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 the issue there is, I guess, compassion. You know, you, you've got to, to listen. You've got to be able to try to mold uh, results that, that, uh, that listen to everybody and understand the situation, take into consideration uh, the, the children in those cases. On the criminal side, and once again, I see this every day, uh, I go to the McDevitt County Jail three times a week, uh, have what we call first appearance hearings and set bonds. And when I do that, I go through a, a list of questions with the uh, inmates and I ask them you know, what their educational background is. The magic, the magic answer is 10th grade. We have a huge problem, and I'm sure you have the same problem here in Wilkes County, uh, with folks dropping out of school. So you drop out of school in the 10th grade, you can't get a job. Uh, so they're all unemployed. The second big issue I see, it, it appears that 85 to 90, maybe more than that percent of the, uh, of the cases are involved some way with drugs. Uh, drugs are just running rampant in our communities. Uh, what I try to do, uh, we have drug court now in Devon County, but you won't get into the you won't get into the drug court system for three to six to nine months. So what I try to do is I try to work with the families, and if, if possible, if they can come up with the location, uh, we put people in rehab. I, in the last month, I put four or five people uh, into rehab facilities as a condition of their bond. That you get to get out if you go to rehab. If you walk away from rehab, you come back to jail, uh, and, and they and it's been very successful. Uh, I've seen three people in the last month or so that are, that are addicted to heroin. And like I say, these families just come to you and they beg you for a solution. No Thank you, Mr. Swan. Now we have a couple of questions for our candidates for the Office of District Attorney for the Toombs Judicial Circuit. And we'll begin with Mr. Davis, Mr. Woody Davis. Mr. Davis, Wilkes County has an aging population and we have a lot of senior citizens. Um, what what would you do to protect uh, seniors in our circuit from fraud and abuse? I'm going to step away just a little bit of the reason why the player from the sun is directly in our side of the um, As far as protection of senior citizens, as, as elder abuse and fraud and such as that, Frankly, it's, it's a matter of education. We need to have outreach uh, programs to reach out to folks uh, who, who are 
elderly, uh, to their caregivers, to their family members, and educate them on the schemes and, and, and the uh, flim-flam artistry that goes on uh, not only in, in Wilkes County, but goes on in every county in our circuit, I'm afraid. Uh, it doesn't just prey on folks uh, uh, who, who are uh, elderly. Sometimes they prey upon to use their credit cards, uh, even in a nursing home situation. So it's a situation where we have to have community outreach from law enforcement uh, to, to educate folks, the caregivers, the family members of the elderly, so that uh, uh, they know what's happening. Uh, also, uh, when you hear a deal is too good to be true, there needs to be a hotline call, I suspect, from the sheriff's department or your local police department. We have a police department in Thompson, uh, in the sheriff's department. There needs to be a line you can call and say, somebody's offered me a deal that's too good to be true. What's the story on that? And can we trust these people? And you need to have feedback uh, from law enforcement, uh, and that can be done. This is, uh, these are not major steps. This can certainly be done in every community in our circuit. And we have a follow-up question. We've got two questions for each candidate. Um, if, if you're elected, uh, how would you see your approach to running the district attorney's office different from the approach of Mr. Sanders, the current DA, if at all? Well, uh, everybody's different, and everybody has a different management style. Uh, and and I, I, will, I will tell you that... Uh, uh, I would not make changes, but quite frankly, I think the changes that I would make would be more community outreach with regard to dealing with uh, citizenry, law enforcement, and the district attorney's office working hand in hand. Uh, I would like to see more involved with the community watch programs. Now, folks from the country, and I was born and raised in the country, uh, we, we look after each other, neighbors looking after neighbors. That's not a foreign concept to us. But you have certain communities and certain neighborhoods uh, in Thompson, you have some here, where everybody's so busy that uh, they forget to look out for one another. Community watch programs can certainly help with that. Uh, it won't prevent crime, folks. There's nothing we can do to prevent crime, but we can lessen it somewhere. And those type of programs, those type of community outreach situations, I think are all good ideas. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And we're going to call on Mr. DuPain now. <coughs> Mr. DuPain, to re refresh your recollection, uh, Wilkes County's population is aging, and we have a lot of senior citizens. And we just like to ask your ideas on protecting those seniors from fraud and abuse, please. Well, as I stated in my opening, I, I believe that our role has to be more than just staying in an office, wait for a file to get to us. We need to get out to the community, spread messages where they need to be spread. One of those is about this type of fraud. I firmly believe that children and the elderly are the most vulnerable members of our society, and that is our highest priority, is protecting them. And when we have our hands on people who have taken advantage, we need to take examples of them and, and prosecute them. I have been very proud of my track record here. I handled a, a horrific case in Tignall involving a teacher who was brutally uh, attacked in her home, and we sent that person to prison even though the victim had passed away before trial and got him convicted in each and every count. Also handled another case recently where an elder person was taken advantage of by somebody in a fiduciary or had a, uh, a duty to look after the person's interest, and that wasn't the case. So a vigorous prosecution once the crimes occurred is key, but also getting the message out to, uh, to warn people um, when the travelers come to your town. We need to be aware of them. We need to look out. And one of the most important things is looking out for your neighbor. If you've got an elderly person in your neighborhood, look out for them. If you see a suspicious truck in the parking lot, go talk to them. These would be the messages that I would hope to deliver with the help of the Sheriff's Department. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Dupay. And the second question is, um, how do you see your approach to running and operating the district attorney's office as differing from the approach of Mr. Sanders, who's the current DA? Yeah, well, first of all, I would tell everybody that the cart is not broken. We have a very good office. We are very good at what we do, which is to prosecute the cases that come to us. Where I see the, the difference in how I would handle it, where I see the opportunity for improvement, is to getting out and being more accessible to the public. I've talked with a lot of people campaigning. They say, well, you know, we, we like the bill. We like to see you up here uh, a little bit more often. All we see you is when there's court going on, and we do have quite a bit of court. But one of the things I would do, we've got room for an office up in the courthouse, and I would want, hopefully it will be me, 
uh, or one of my assistants being up on a regular basis in Wilkes County so if people had questions they could come to the courthouse and get some advice as opposed to having to travel to Thompson or to, uh, or to call us on the phone. If people in Wilkes County and the outlying counties have just as much right and need to see us in their counties on a regular basis. And aside from that, that kind of approach will help us become more keyed in on what's important in the community and what we need to do to help out. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Dupay. Uh, we've got some questions for the candidates for sheriff of Wilkes County now. And we'll begin with Sheriff Mark Moore. Sorry. Sorry. My agenda says something different. <laughs> okay. We're going to shift gears and go to the tax commissioner candidates. And we'll begin with Lisa, Lisa Dozier. Ms. Dozier, uh, there seems to be some confusion among some members of the public about the duties of a tax commissioner. Uh, some people believe that the tax office decides how much tax should be paid or who should be taxed. Uh, could you please explain to the audience the responsibilities of the tax commissioner and the tax commissioner's office, please? The duties of the tax commissioner is to collect taxes and to distribute taxes. The actual tax rate between the county, the school, and the state until after this year. And this year, there will be no more state taxes on the tax digest. The, that, that, the tax digest comes from the tax assessor's office. They do the taxation part of the property, and all the tax commissioner's office does is actually collect the taxes after the tax digest is in approved. All right. Thank you. And we have a, a second question for you. Um, and it relates to the renewal date for vehicle tax. Uh, our audience knows that uh, renewal dates are based on the individual's birth date. Uh, unfortunately, some of us get to renew the car tag on that date, and we end up paying late fees that are assessed when we do renew. Uh, do you think it's possible that a computer-generated program could be instituted to generate reminder notices to Wilkes County residents or even allow residents to pay online uh, and avoid coming to the courthouse. Is that feasible? Absolutely. The tax office, at the moment, there's a modernization done to the tax office. Can however, you please speak into the mic a little more? There is a modernization that's needed, but however, it should be at the expense of the taxpayer. It should be at the expense of the person who's actually wanting those services. And there are some. There are some programs that are out there that would be able to do that. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're going to, we've got a couple of questions for Mr. Dean Hubbard, who is also a candidate for the Office of Wilkes County Tax Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Hubbard, if, if you're elected, what changes in the Tax Commissioner's Office would you implement? Changes. Um, well, I think it's really good. I will... I would like to see it modernized too. You know, I think a debit card needs to be in it because even Posse's hardware has a debit card machine. Um, as far as like, it's that the tax commissioner cannot really make changes in the government, in county government. So, as far as running the office any different, it's like just. The state tells you how to run it, and that's how you run it. Um, as long as you collect taxes and distribute it in a timely manner, I think now it's doing every two weeks, and um, so the school gets their money in the county and the state. But um, I, I really see uh, no problems other than updating the office and technology. Right. Thank you. And the second question is, uh, your opponent, Ms. Dozier, has 16 years' experience working in the tax office. Um, what relevant experience and learning would you bring to the job of tax commissioner? Okay, um, well, I've been around it for, since I was six years old. So to say I don't know what's going on is an understatement. I mean, my mom will leave that job for 20 plus years. So I do know how to sell tags on the computer, issue tags, collect TAB tax, um, do the digest, because she would bring it home and I would watch her. 
um, make the distribution. Um, I just I know this. I mean, I'd like to add this too. Um, I know my candidate can say she's got 16 years experience, but um, there's been two probate judges, one magistrate judge, and two tax commissioners that had no experience before they went in office. And I think everybody here would say they've done a fine job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, now we can uh, get back on track with the uh, candidates for the office of Wilkes County Sheriff. Uh, Sheriff Mark Moore, this question is for you. Uh, what is the highest need of the Sheriff's Department now, and what would you do to fill that need? Oh, uh, you need to know. But the, the greatest you know, public you know, concern with the sheriff's office, the public office, has been the been two things public safety and, you know, and property crimes. But, you know, found out that most, most citizens are almost concerned about that. You know, the kids are in school. All the kids say it's, it's school, you know, or, or it's, it's traffic being handled correctly in the school. Uh, We've got so much traffic in now the, the, the school on, on the bypass. There's been a lot of concern about that. Uh, and it's been, it, I've addressed, I've addressed it by assigning deputies to, to handle it. We've had a smooth flow and very, very few, few accidents. Uh, though we have made numerous attempts with DOT to, to have uh, a different procedure in place that will handle uh, the, the traffic flow, that is a light, but we've been unable to do that so far. But I'll still, if, if they had the light, I would still have to get these there to route the traffic. If we do that same that same thing on Rock Kings Avenue. Secondly, in public safety, before I took office as chair, uh, there were there was no security at public meetings. Uh, the court the, the courtroom security the uh, plan has been revamped by me. The uh, there's no government meetings, school board meetings. This public meeting right here, and our deputy sheriff's here right now signed for public safety. Uh, I just cannot, the sheriff, have have a problem of someone coming in disturbing or causing someone get to get hurt. So that's been a main priority we made is to is to address the public safety concerns here. And if you go to the sheriff's office and you were to walk back there where all my deputies are every day, there are posters all over the place, concerns about people calling to check my property. So, so we have great priority on patrol and, and investigation of, uh, of property crimes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have a question for Deputy Greg Rogers now. Uh, Mr. Rogers, if you're elected, uh, what would your priorities in law enforcement for the next several years be? I mean, uh, I would love to have uh, deputies at the school go to the school on the field trips, uh, football games, baseball games, because our children are our number one fun. And like you said, the school traffic out there, that's a big priority. I've worked it for, uh, I don't know how long now, probably it's been 12 years, maybe more. And uh, ever since the school has been built, I've seen a lot of good stuff that could be turned into Real bad rent. It needs to be more supervised, I believe, to have deputies running radar and slowing traffic down. Because uh, I have pop some that come through that and they need to be stopped and warned or maybe write a ticket. But our children, like I say, our children are our future. Uh, protecting the elderly here in town. I've had a lot of requests, but they don't have the protection now that the city is. And I'm willing to step up and do what I can. Like I say, I got an open door policy. I'll address anything you have. Just, you know, if I need to do something else, I'll do what I got to do. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we have a question for Commissioner Esper Lee. Uh, Mr. Lee, our question is sort of general for you. What do you see as Wilkes County's most challenging issue or issues at this time? 
what I see at this time should that should be addressed by the commissioners is efficiency. Our county government has evolved to what we have here today. Um, it cannot be changed overnight, and it was a gradual process into what we have here today. And what I want to, to if I'm elected, what I want to work on is efficiency. Uh, for example, we have voting places like uh, maybe in Tignal, and we have another one maybe at the, at the uh, Senior Citizen, uh, another one at the Pope Center. Well, if we could uh, probably combine all these places into one place, we'd probably have fewer poll workers and save the county tax dollars in, in, fashions, like, in fashions like that. So the one word that I would say is efficiency. Now, we have a great board of commissioners, and I hope I can supplement them because they have some great minds. And efficiency is the one issue that I would promote. Thank you, Mr. Lee. We appreciate it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we that's the last of our questions for the uh, candidates who are who have opposition for office. Uh, now we're going to introduce to you those candidates who are unopposed in their uh, We're going to begin with uh, County Commissioner for District 1, and that seat is currently held by Mr. Ed Gettys, and we're going to call on him first. You're just about as bad as John's District 2, not 1. <laughs> Cases a year. That's new cases, and also we have over well over a hundred 
um, cases that other petitions have filed um, on the existing cases. Traffic court, we handle no less than 1,200 cases a year, and sometimes we handle as many as 2,200 cases a year. And my firm pulled the files today, and out of our, and those are Mr. Mink cases, and out of those cases right there, uh, 14, over 1,400 cases, 12 months prior from today's date, only 12 of those transferred to the Superior Court for the man for jury trial. So uh, most of those cases are resolved in high court, which saving the Superior Court. A lot of times concentrate on these other cases they're talking about tonight, your murders and your, your child molestation, uh, your, your domestic disputes, different things like that this morning. Uh, election, busy year for elections. Uh, this year is one of our busiest years. We've got multiple elections this year. We have one in March, we'll have one here in May, we'll have possibly a runoff in July, we'll have a general election in November, and possibly a runoff in January of next year. So, and there's a lot of things that have to go on during election time, and it has to be done in a timely manner. Uh, so, I come to work every morning about 7 o'clock, and uh, I leave uh, a lot of these five, and to be honest with you, I'm on call. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, people don't realize it, but I do orders to apprehend. And I can, I've been called and been in the hospital from 12 to 4 o'clock to send somebody to East Central for an evaluation. Uh, I do first opinion. Uh, so I'm on call there, 24 7. So, uh, but I'm going to be honest with you, I really love my job. Uh, and I appreciate the support of the uh, voters here in Wilkes County. They've allowed me to run my second term on a post and now going to my third term. And I appreciate it. We'll see. And we have a candidate for Chief Magistrate Judge of Wilkes County. Uh, she's currently, is a Deputy Magistrate, is that what you, or, or just Magistrate? I'm actually an on-call manager. Is there on-call manager. Some people call us Associate Manager, but there are no such things. Now I get the introducing you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Judge Deborah Green, and she's running for the chief magistrate position that uh, Judge Rosalie Martin currently occupies. And I have been blessed to be on the post for this office, and I am very, very thankful for that. I have worked with Judge Martin for the last, working on my 15th year. And as she retires and I have the opportunity to take over in January, I will not be filling shoes, but I will be doing my best to stand aside. Through my time as, as working with her, we do still hearings up to $15,000. We do arrest warrants, search warrants, first appearance hearings, <coughs> pre-warrant hearings. <coughs> And along with that, we are <coughs> counselors, we are mothers, we are buffers, we are referees. Being in a small town, working in a small court, there are laws and guidelines that we have to follow, and there are things that we can do, things that we cannot do. And there's a gray line in there that we sometimes go <coughs> a little to the edge to do what we can for you. Whereas working in Atlanta, everything appears to be rubber stamp. They don't have time for you. They have so many things going on, so much happening. They have specific people doing specific jobs. And a lot like the other government agencies that come in, what's your name, what you want, how soon can I get you out of here? We take our time, we do what we can to help you within the parameters of the law that we can work with, we'll sit and talk with you. Sometimes somebody just needs an ear. Somebody needs to explain their side of something. And it never goes any further than that. But we are there to listen, to help, to try and solve the issues and problems before it has to go to the bench. We do what we can. We are not attorneys. We are people just like you. We put our hands on them at the time, just like you. But we are trained through various schools throughout the year to learn the laws, to watch as they change. To <coughs> but we're there to help you. We're not there to see who we can do the worst to or take sides because you're my friend and you made me mad. We are a fair, unbiased <coughs> support. Our 
doors are always open. We are always willing to sit and listen to you with the information that we can listen to. Now, if you brought a case before us, the first thing we're going to tell you is, I can't listen to you, which is going to make you mad because you want to tell us what's going on. That we cannot listen to you because we have to be impartial. We cannot, and I'm sure you wouldn't want us to listen to the other side as they tell us how terrible you are and all the bad things that you've done. So we have this preconceived idea of what you are and what you've done before we ever hear the case. So our standard statement is we can't talk to you and you need to talk to an attorney. There are a lot of things we don't know and we don't know on purpose because if we did know, we'd have to lie to you and tell you we don't know. And there's so many things that we do need to know that we stay up on that the things that we are not allowed to tell you, we purposely don't know. We do our best to do what we can for you. I appreciate your confidence in our office and the things that we have done. I am a District 10 representative. I am a mentor judge. Our doors will always be open, and I hope that if anything at all we can review from you, that you feel comfortable and free to walk in our doors. Thank you, Jennifer. And finally, we're going to call on the partner, Blake Thompson. He's going to tell us a little bit about himself and also about the duties of the partner. Well, thank y'all for being here uh, tonight. Uh, I've been doing EMS for 43 years. I've been on about 22,000 animal calls. Um, I was born in Addison, South Carolina. I was raised in Hart County. Uh, I've been here for 25 years. Uh, I was a EMS director out of Athens Regional. I've been a EMS director here for, uh, for 25 years. I'm the EMA director here in Mills County. I had an opportunity to leave here about four years ago. This is my home. Uh, this is where I'm going to be married at. This is where I'm going to be living at. I've got two kids. I love them in Mills out of town. Uh, I look part of this too. I'm 61. I don't know why y'all tell the age. I'm 20, 29, but I'm sick. But to make a long story short, I love everything I've done here for the last 25 years. Uh, I can talk to you all night about EMS, fire, whatever. But on the corner side, I, I was a deputy corner out of Elder County for years. When I moved here, uh, uh, they made me deputy corner in 92, this morning, I think. And, uh, I ran for sheriff in 2008, got beat real bad. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but the biggest thing about it, uh, I've enjoyed being 28 years as a deputy coroner in both counties. Uh, this is my second term here in Wilkes. I've been a county coroner for five years. I do about 40 a year uh, average. Uh, you times that about 32 years, that's about 12,000. I'm at 1,200 co uh, calls, death investigation. Uh, we, we do a 40 hour class for a basic corner, then you have to do a 24 hours a year for uh, uh, training. I've got about 1,400 hours of training in corn. Out of the sheriff, out, out of Elberton, Clark County, Clark County, wherever I've been at, uh, I, I'm really enjoying the investigation here in, in our county. I work real close to them, I work real close to the GBI. I don't think that they did it I got a, and I'll tell you, I do have a problem with a crime lab in the case. Uh, we won't talk about it, but I'll give them a call. Run it over what I've got to do, and I do have a problem with uh, the crime lab uh, in the, the cab county. And I think some of the deputies will tell you why, but I, I'm not going to tell you why. But that's, that's my uh, position here. Uh, uh, on, on the core side, you know, I hate to say it, but I love I love to get that call. I hope I never get another call. I love the investigation. Right. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the closing statements by those candidates who have opposition in their uh, races. And we're going to use reverse alphabetical order now. Uh, we're going to begin with Senate candidate Brenda Jerry. I didn't finish some stuff.
stuff I was saying, I didn't tell you that in a sense of adult sunscreen picture since 1980. I'm also a member of the next card. OES 398 in Hart County. I'm a dedicated person, whatever's put before me. I do my best to help people wherever they are, whatever I can do. I promise you I will work with your county government and your city government. I promise you that I'll work with your EMS systems, your fire departments, your infrastructure. And this is something all counties have got to do. We've got to go down and create the infrastructure because we're going to grow. Whether we realize it or not, people are going to start coming because we're going to be the bedrooms of these larger cities. So we've got to furnish some water. We've got to have everything we need in place. There are grants. They are uh, things you get from the state. And as your senator, I promise you, as a rural Georgia county, you will not be forgotten by anyone else in this state. Not by Metro Atlanta or any other big cities like that who, who really control this state. It used to be the rural Georgia controlled the state of Georgia. Now it's the metro area. If you look at the last gov the last race they run and just uh, analyzing of it, we got to get the rural Georgia back on the map all over this state and say, hey, we're people too, and we count, and we pay our taxes. But I promise you one thing, I will be there for you. I owe no favors to anybody. I owe nothing to anyone. Nobody buys my cornbread and buttermilk. So I'm there to represent you, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gary. And we're going to uh, ask Mr. Grabowski for his closing statement. Thank you all very much. I know it's hot. You know, folks want to get going. I just wanted to reiterate to all of you that all my life I've been serving in the military. That's what I know. To me, everybody's American. I don't think about this state or that state, the north or the south. Okay, when I was in the military, every American was in there. They were from the south. They were from the west. They were black. They were white. They were Hispanic. Men and women. We're all Americans. We have to start coming together. That's what I'm about. That's why I'm here. Because I see what the sacrifice is on the other side. And we all bleed red. And that's a fact. And it's happening. And it's happening now. We have our boys and girls overseas fighting for what? For right here. For this. For the freedom to come here and listen to all of us tell you how we're going to take care of it. For a turn. Then hopefully somebody else will come along. That's what I'm about. I promise to work for you 100%. That's what I've done my entire life. In the I will figure out the problems, I will talk with everybody, and I will make sure every county is represented properly, because we're all Americans at the end of the day. So God bless all of you, and I hope we get out here soon. Thank you, Mr. I want to leave you with a little thought, that is, they say that the definition of insanity is repetition of action and expectations of different outcomes. So we've been blessed to be represented by Senator Bill Jackson for many years, and uh, I really respect his service. But we're at a turning point in District 24, and I do feel like it's time that we send some new ideas and some new voices to Atlanta. And I have served on many, many boards, and uh, we've had a lot of successes, and that's because we've worked together to achieve some great end results. I won't bore you because I, I've done it on the back table, so I hope you'll pick us up and read it. Um, I wasn't the one who did a lot of that. I was just blessed by being able to lead. One of the things we've done is we've built a $5.5 million children's hospital called at the Medical College of Georgia, and I'm very thankful for being allowed to do that. I've served on the CPB, the Development Authority. It was under the uh, CPB that we actually developed the Clarksville uh, Partnership, so we bring others with us, because to succeed, we've got to bring other counties and other people with us. The last thing I've been doing, and uh, that is that I've been serving on the Upper Obichi Savannah Water Council. And uh, when you see Senator Montcalm call, he's been wonderful. He's been a, a great supporter of protecting our water rights and keeping us from having it in a water basin. So I'll tell you, I'm making two promises. If I'm not elected, you will not see my name on another political sign. 
And the reason is, I am asking people like every one of you in this room to help support me with your vote and your contribution. If not elected, I personally feel I've left the game. Second, if you do elect me, I'm going to work double time for you. And I'm going to get to the bottom of a lot of issues. And we're going to communicate. And I'm going to, I'm going to do what Senator White did in stone. When he was the senator, he would come out and host meetings. And I will do the same thing. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, Ms. Newman. Thank y'all for letting me be a part of it tonight. I'm not a politician. I got into government because there was a need in my community, and my neighbors thought I'd be a good fit to fill that need. Evidently, they enjoyed what I did because they elected me mayor after that. So through that, I grew a passion for government, for helping people. I feel strongly that we all have a duty to leave our community a better place for our children to inherit. And that's what drives me, that's what motivates me, that's why I'm running for Senate District 24. I want, I think of my son Patrick, who's four years old now, and I want him, when he graduates college, to be able to get a job right here in our community. I don't want, when he graduates, to have to get a job somewhere else, so I have to drive an ungodly amount of, uh, an un ungodly amount of time to go see my grandchildren. I want to be able to go see my grandchildren with Little League games. I want to be able to load them up with sugar and candy and send them back home to his parents to get back, pay back for everything he's put me through over the years. We need that here. We need jobs. We need good paying jobs. We need uh, jobs for our college employed, or our college with those with college degrees. And that's what I'll fight for. Yeah. As, as a mayor of Bowman, it, my work in Upper County, Upper County and Wilkes County are very similar. We face a lot of the same issues. I know the issues y'all face. I've been facing them for the last several years, and I'm ready to face them for y'all as well. I know that I know what the importance of working with our local, county, and state officials working together to make sure we're getting things done. And I promise you, Sam will know he can call me anytime. Ames will know he can call me anytime. I'll be right there. I'll be right here at every event, or not every event, but everyone I can get to. I'll be a part of your community. I'll be open and accountable to everyone here in this community. I have my cell phone, my personal cell phone number on all my business cards are in the back. Please feel free to grab one. I'll be just a phone call away for whenever y'all need me. So thank y'all for your time tonight. I would definitely uh, appreciate your support, and I'd be honored to be your next state senator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. We're going to hear from Joe Edge now. Well, thank you. I've been blessed to be able to spend a good bit of time in Wilkes County the last few weeks. I've met uh, several of your officials, uh, and you really do have a great set of elected officials here. Uh, and I really do believe that they always have the best interest of Wilkes County at heart. Um, this position that I am running for is about jobs and taxes, okay? I have a plan. I have an actual written plan on how to bring jobs back to rural Georgia. I have shared this plan with the economic development authority of each county, and uh, the last county was Augusta, Richmond County. I shared it with the Walter Sprouse over there the other day. I said, Joe, if you can get this approved, it will bring tens of thousands of jobs to the state and thousands to this district. That's what we need. Every single problem that we have in this district is centered around jobs. This notion that people are just going to start moving here is false. It's not correct. They're not going to move here if we don't have the infrastructure and we don't have the jobs. I deal with this every day in my job, in my, my career, my company. We go out in the recruit industry, we bring them in. I understand the issues related to it, and I know how to create jobs. I employ 45 people, so I, I get it. Uh, you want to get to the fair tax, the zero percent state income tax? You have to increase the job base. You do that by adding jobs. It's not rocket science. So. You know, rural Georgia, I feel, has been neglected uh, for a while. And it is time that you have a strong voice in Atlanta. You need somebody that is a strong negotiator and somebody that is an effective communicator. And I believe that I fit the bill for that. You know, it's time that rural Georgia had a competitive edge in Atlanta. But in order to have that competitive edge, you first have to vote for Joe Edge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edge. And we're going to call on the Anderson. Once again, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for coming and listening to everybody. It is a pleasure to be here. 
I want to say I want to thank my wife for being here tonight. She, uh, she's a retired educator, and she's my other two thirds. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm not no public speaker. But what I am, I'm a workhorse, not a show horse. I'm plain, simple, and common sense. I'm conservative, and I'm a Republican. I'd like to be your next state senator. I started out on the school board, served on the school board, and learned there. I served as a county commissioner, learned there. I went on the state representative, and I learned there. I represented you in Atlanta. I'm a servant, not a politician. I love to serve. I love helping people. I love helping the true need. Also, I believe in communication. And this is how I communicate. Your chairman, your mayor, your sheriff knows and has seen me call them in the past for information from this area that we can serve you the best way we can in Atlanta to get the most for Wilkes County. I'm rooted to Wilkes County. I bought my first car ever in Wilkes County in Washington, Georgia, right there in the downtown from the great Senator Sam McGill. I know that I worked with him in the past. So I go back almost 40 years. So I know Wilkes County. I'm here to serve you as your state senator, and also I can tell you how we can save money already. Vote for Lee Anderson and prevent a runoff, and we'll save tax dollars. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Anderson. We appreciate it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to hear from our candidates for the Superior Court vacancy uh, based on Judge Dunway's retirement. Here's Bubba Swan. I too want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, it's been a long night, uh, and uh, it's all of us would like to talk more and get in more depth, but that's not possible. I had a lot of people ask me, you know, why, why would you put yourself through this? Why do you want to run for this job? And it's a simple answer. I love my community, and as I mentioned before, I love this whole area. I've got connections in my family, one way or the other, to most of the counties in this six-county circuit. And that goes back a long way. Uh, when I was three years old, uh, my father was a major sheriff in Denver County. And I don't know about the Moore brothers, but uh, we lived in jail until I was 14 years old. So I didn't just see my dad come home at night, but, but I saw him every day. I, I lived it. And what I saw was a community service. I saw somebody that loved people. I saw somebody that treated everybody the same. And when I went to, to college, I decided that what I was going to do because I was going to be a community servant myself. Uh, and I was going to do that through uh, practice of law. My father told me, you know, when the law enforcement, he'd kill me. So, uh, obviously, your father didn't tell you that. But, uh, so I, I, I went to law school. And the day I came back uh, uh, to Thompson to practice law, I was as proud as I could be. And over the last 30 years, uh, I've practiced law in this whole circuit. Like I said, I've done a lot of work here. Used to come up here all the time, the old first federal savings loan, closed loans. Uh, I've done a wide variety of things. But as far as public service, is go service goes, uh, I've played several roles in the county. Uh, I've been involved in everything I can to help make my community a better place. On the legal side, I've given away hundreds and hundreds of hours of legal services because that's just the right thing to do. need help. And you can trust me to do the right thing. You know, thank you, thank you for just one time. Thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and talk with you this evening. And I, I, I say that I'm asking for your vote, uh, and I'm asking for your trust, as several of the candidates have said. And the Office of Superior Court Judge is in a very serious position. And I'm asking you for the power to supervise government agencies, to supervise law enforcement, 
supervised conduct. That's a very serious problem. Twelve years ago, our Superior Court judges appointed me to the Office of Juvenile Court Judge, and I have repaid them by working just as hard as I can to give this county, this circuit, the best juvenile court in the state. And I commit to you, if you entrust me with that power, I will continue to operate under the same guidelines that I have done at this point. Open access to the courts, explanation for the court's rulings, um, holding people accountable and being accountable. And I thank you for your time. And I would love to meet you. If you have any questions for me, I would be happy to speak to you, Brother Pastor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to call Mr. Bill McKay, who's a candidate for district attorney. Some 25 years ago, my girlfriend at the time was now my wife's kid, and said, You need to come out and visit my mom and dad. They live out on Pistol Creek. I said, Okay, I love to fish. I'll go out. And after this first night of uh, sleeping out in this area of the country, this area of the state, right here across the line in Lincoln County, I knew this is where we needed to be. So we were then married uh, several years later at the Ola Baptist Church. We have two kids. I have a 20-year-old son, and I have a 14-year-old boy. And Wilkes County has always been a very special place for me. I've been here all 18 years. That courtroom is one of the most beautiful courtrooms I've ever had the privilege of conducting my trade in. And I really appreciate being here. One of the unique things about prosecuting, especially in a small community, and it's happened several times, I will prosecute somebody, and they're not always happy with me. I've got a tough job to do, and I'm going to do it fair, and I'm going to be firm, and I'm going to be just, but I'm going to do my job. That doesn't always go over well with the family of the person I'm prosecuting. But what I've seen happen time and time again is maybe several years later, somebody in their family might be a victim of a crime. And then they get to know me, they get to see me as the one standing up for their rights in court, and they understand the big picture, that I have a job to do. You're not going to agree with every single decision that I make as an assistant DA or as a district attorney. It is impossible. It just won't happen that way. But when I make a decision, I can guarantee you I made it because I felt like it was the right thing to do. And if you examine my entire body of work of 18 years here, you'll you'll see a very favorable picture of me. Ask around. You work very closely with your law enforcement, very closely with, with the EMS. Ask them about how accessible I am. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I've been in vacation out of state, and I get calls from law enforcement for suggestions on how to build a better case so we don't lose it on the technicality. And that's all done on my own expense with my cell phone, not paid for in any way, shape, or form other than out of my wallet. But it's what I need to do to better serve you as the public here in Wilkes County. So I'm asking for your vote to elect me as your next district attorney. Thank you, Mr. Next, we're going to hear from Mr. Woody Davis, also a candidate for district attorney. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Republican candidate for district attorney, I believe and I feel the VA needs to be more engaged in the law enforcement agencies of our circuit. Because with a stronger partnership with law enforcement, we can become more effective in prosecuting criminal cases. And that is indeed what we're all about. We also need to become more engaged with the citizens of our circuit. Because folks, let's face it, Y'all, as citizens, make up our juries. Y'all, as citizens, make up our grand juries. And with a stronger bond and a stronger engagement between the citizens and the district attorney's office, we can ensure more successful prosecutions. Because very well and truly, that is what we are about in the criminal trade. Folks, uh, I've been here for 22 years. I have uh, attempted to live by the pledge that I will enforce the laws of this state, I will enforce our Constitution, I will treat people fairly, I will, I will do my job without fear, without favor, without prejudice, no matter who's involved on the other side. That, that continues to be my pledge, that continues to be what I live by, and I ask for your support, and I ask for your vote for this return. Thank you, Mr. Davis. We're going to shift our attention to Dean Hubbard, who's a candidate for Wilkes County Tax Commission. I'd like to thank everybody again for having me and the rest of the candidates so you can get to know each one. Um, I see the Tax Commission as a public servant for Wilkes County, playing a simple point line. Um, and I'm willing to serve them, and I'll 
put my heart and soul into serving people just as my mom has for the last 20 years. I also would like to say that, um, reiterate that whether I be elected or someone with 16 years experience, you have to go to school to be tax commissioner. You do not get certified overnight to be tax commissioner. Um, and also the fact that there have been numerous elected officials that received that went in office with no work experience in the office. But if given the chance, I'm confident in saying that I will and can serve you to the best of my ability. Thank you, Mr. Hubbard. Crimes and their investigation 
and in, in investigation of illegal drugs in our community. I have worked closely with other law enforcement agencies surrounding us, other police, GSP, GBI, other state, and federal agencies. I have demanded accountability from my employees, and I have conducted fair and equal housing practices. If re-elected, I will continue to provide Brooks County with a professional law enforcement agency that, that, that provides law enforcement services to all of Wells County and all be fair and well for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Miller. Now we're going to shift our attention to the candidate for county commission for District 1, Mr. Esther Lee. Mr. Lee, everything has flowed so smoothly and we've got more time than we thought, so we're going to give you 30 minutes. <laughs> adjustments to save your tax dollars. So, in closing, I ask that you select a Democratic ballot. Otherwise, my name is not going to be on it. So, please select a Democratic ballot and please support me. And if you don't live in my district, please talk to someone that does. Thank you and good night. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Uh, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, we want to thank you for, for coming tonight to, to enjoy this uh, candidates forum. I, I enjoyed it. I found it very informative, and I hope you did too. We also want to encourage you to vote on May 24th in the primary election. And I would be remiss if we didn't thank the folks that were responsible for putting this on. Uh, we're going to say thank you to the news reporter. Uh, and also to the Washington Mills Chamber of Commerce, and also to the Court Street Livery, because it provided us with the venue for us to hold this for. We appreciate that very much. And I'm addressing my comments to the audience. Don't you think all the candidates deserve a round of applause for coming tonight?